Hello again. Today we're going to look at some techniques uh, that I use in a lot of my stitching and is, is seen primarily in the little Otto um, pincushion that um, I have in a burrow style or a sashiko style. So we're going to be looking at a stitch called French glove stitch. It's not widely known but it has been around a very very long time and it was used primarily to sew felt together or felted wool so you can see on this little dragon everything here is stitch with french glove stitch and in this case it's with a, um, a sort of a metallic thread and, and i did this many years ago uh, many many years ago when i used to go to a church youth group uh, we had a leader who loved to work in felt and she taught us how to do French glove stitch. It is used to make gloves originally, but was always used to sew felt together. It's very decorative, very strong, and it can be stuffed very, very firmly without movement of the stitch. Uh, I have never used um, blanket stitch to sew felt up. up. Blanket stitch is quite slow to do compared to uh, glove stitch. And I, once you master glove stitch, you will tend to use it a lot where they're using um, blanket stitch now. Okay, so I have a few things that um, where I've used glove stitch. Glove stitch is on this little little decorative um, miniature pin cushion. Uh, lots of felt going on here. And on just here as well as a flat uh, stitch I have it around this hexagon little hexagon um, coaster drinks coaster and it's to get the edges to really well defined as you can see okay there and of course it's very decorative as well I also have it on the edges of these bags here this very edge here has glove stitch and that actually was very useful because it sewed down or stitched down the lining and it reinforced where the um, twist the cork cord in this case um, wax cotton cord went through the loops as I sew through it so it did double duty and it's also in this little one as well on the very edge i find that depending on the scale of the item i will make the stitch bigger or smaller which is very easy to do also it's one of those stitches it's very easy to learn and takes a while to perfect okay when saying that i'm now going to clear a little way off some things and get to work so we're looking at the little otto borrow style pin cushion so we can get to the point where we're doing glove stitch okay so put those out of the way as well so what i've done here is i prepared a strip of fabric as you can see here and this is we'll measure it for you 27 centimeters or around about 11 inches by almost three almost three i'm not really fussy about the size that i do uh, you might notice they're all different sizes every single one i do i just do it differently i'm a bit like that i like variety okay so we have cream borrow or um, vintage looking borrow style stitching uh, we have classic we have stitch and flip style which you will see in my other video my my youtube video on um, the glasses case you will see that technique this is a different type of sashiko called um, kogan called kogan and your glove stitch is featured very heavily in here and it's quite a contrast too so this end and this end and the joining side there 
And this one is in half halfway production and so is this one. This one was a stitch and flip again. So you can see inside the foundation and the panels here. And you can also see some tacking thread, especially on this one because it's a very uh, a contrast colour, which I've used to turn in the edges. But of course, before you do that, you need to join this in a loop. Okay, so I always do my borrow style work on a foundation for strength. Strength. Because you're working with raw edges, you could have the danger of these separating. And then if they do, you'll end up with holes, which obviously you would have to repair. But then again, that's all in the style of the stitching. So repairing is good. But for extra strength, I put my work onto a foundation of calico, as you can see there. But you can also see I have not stitched the end part here. It is not stitched at all. And this is so I can place this side inside that little flap area, pin that together, the pin, and then stitch that. So it will almost look like you cannot find the join when I do stitch that. So I will use, I use um, crochet thread or finer thread. I never use sashiko thread for this purpose because I think it is too bulky. It is too bulky. Uh, it, everyone has their own opinion about how they stitch in this style. I prefer mine to be finer and if you use finer thread, you'll use mostly then a finer needle and your stitches will be smaller and finer. So I prefer that look. I prefer to be able to see my fabric style and my stitches are almost a secondary thing. Some of them, they're obvious, quirky little ones, but other ones are there just to hold the interesting piece of fabric down. Now, as I said, everyone will do this differently. It's almost like your fingerprint. It's a very individual thing to do. Okay, because I've overlapped so much, it's got a very secure area. And now I'm just going to show you what I, how I would stitch this, just briefly, and then we'll move on. Okay, so I'm going to emulate this side here, I like to have short and long stitches. It's a little bit like my, my signature of my work. Uh, I have a lot of um, stitching on and off areas just to make it a little more interesting rather than do straight lines that are all parallel that continue right around the piece. To my way of thinking, that is canther stitching, which is Indian style um, patching and it's you are more likely to be looking at that stitching than this one so I like to keep mine a bit more more delicate so I will continue back and forward across there until that is joined and then that will be ready to go to for the next stage okay so I'll leave that aside okay so let's look at this one um, people who know me know that I have been a Sashiko stitcher for many years, nearly 20 years now. And I'm a bit of a different stitcher. I'm a transfer stitcher, meaning that I use Japanese carbon paper or Chaco paper to transfer my own designs to my fabric. And that way I can use any fabric I like. And I am never then worried about cutting it up. Some people are very, very apprehensive about cutting their Sashiko up. It is quite safe to do so if you want to put it into small items. It is the way to go because then you can do big pieces and cut them up accordingly to what you want to use them for. And it almost becomes a resource. I don't always use my sashiko in quilts. Um, if I'd be, I'd be making quilts constantly if I did. But I do use it in lots of other different applications such as little bags even in this pentagon area here. Um, in the, especially into these pin cushions. I love putting it into these pin cushions. Uh, but 
it's it's a good thing to remember that it is uh, able to be cut up without the stitching coming undone it will not come undone okay so i'm up to the stage where i've sewn this in a loop and i've turned the raw long edges over and i've tacked them down so they don't get in my way and now we're going to look at what you put on the top and the bottom as far as the felted area for your pincushion okay there are lots of different styles of felt and i tend to use handmade felt i'm involved with the victorian felt makers in melbourne victoria and we make our own felt now i know that not everybody can do that who is able has the resources to do that so we will look into what alternatives there are to use as well as handmade felt my kits always have my handmade felt in them so you get a chance to have a have a go at um, stitching it okay handmade felt we'll, we'll look at that first for um, these pin cushions it's very thick you can see here how thick it is Okay, that's a good quarter inch of thickness. And this is why, again, glove stitch is so good to be able to stitch this thickness together. This makes the top and the bottom, because there's no top or bottom, very strong. Very, very strong. But the action of homemade felt, or um, as, as opposed to commercial felt, is the fact that the more times that you put pins into it, it actually increases the felting process. Being that it's pure wool, merino wool, the little hooks on the wool hook together and create the felt and make it even stronger as you use it with the action of piercing it. Okay, when we make felt um, in large pieces, we use friction, water, warm water and soap and um, a product called wool tops or very fine wool which is off the sheep it's cleaned it's sometimes colored and then it's um, it's like it's it's very very fine like powder puff like like a like a um, cotton ball almost except it's wool now these ones that i'm using today i'm going to be using today are hand dyed as well in indigo so indigo and wool love each other you always get very good results with indigo and wool now you can see this is quite knobbly too now this means that it's it's a very harsh process that i used uh, and it's so it becomes very dense felt so we wouldn't be wearing felt that looked like that um, but is good for this purpose. So we would not take the felting pro process this far when we're doing it for garments. Okay, let's have a look at other types of felt or felted wool or, or okay, commercial felt. This is a commercial needled felt and it has been rainbow dyed. Okay, it's still wool, not uh, acrylic or, po or polyester, which you can get a lot now. How do you tell? Well, if it's good quality felt, you can't put your finger through it. And that's really important, especially for what we're, we're going to do. You don't want the top and the bottom of your pincushion to wear out um, and get holes in it. Okay, so this is a commercial one. This is another handmade one, but not taken as the felting process is far as this one so you can see this is a lot smoother it's also a lot finer and because it's a lot finer it has a slight amount of stretch to it so i like to do my felting quite a bit thicker as you can see than this one so it's a lot lot denser and it hasn't got so much stretch in it and much easier to sew onto your tube okay Okay, that's moving on to different type of felted wool too. Felted wool or blanketing felting is very, very slightly felted and you can still see the grain of the wool. So it's a woven fabric. It's still a woven fabric and this will fray. You have to, if you were going to use this as the discs on your pincushion, you would have to overcast the edge 
before you glove stitch because it would fray away and break away from the rest of the fabric. Uh, these are great, are great for applique purposes and very decorative purposes, but not for what we, we want to use today. And this is another one another type of wool a bit denser it's it's almost um it's a, still a woven wool you can still pick them off but it's it's been slightly felted after the weaving process so this is a lot more stable uh, and you could probably use that for this purpose okay this is a quite an expensive one so i'll show you what it looks like when i've felted a big piece this is one that's felt with lots of different colours of blues and greens. And I've cut leaves out of it as well, but I've also cut circles um, out of this, this piece as well. So quite often we'll do a big piece of felt um, for different reasons to use as a, as I said, as a resource. Okay. I also use my felted wool in creative processes. So this is a piece here that is being cut it's been felt, it's been dyed in the indigo, and then it's been added on to some borrow style stitching uh, of mine. And this is a, a wall hanging art piece. Uh, and it was actually felted through what we call a scrim. And this is the um, leftover of the scrim here, which you can see. And it gives you an interesting textural result you can see the texture of the scrim here and the the wool is felted through that really well it really holds on to each other quite well and gives you this very interesting appearance so felting is a very interesting and um a very a good thing to use for lots of different reasons so i use it in my work qu quite a big bit um, for a bit of variety as well. So let's get back to how we work out how big these discs should be to fit in to our, um, our tube that we have prepared. And as I said before, these tubes can be any size you like and mine are all different sizes, as you can see. So because they are all different sizes, you would have to work out what size each one's disc will be. So in my pattern, I have a standard size and a standard pattern for the di discs ends is provided. So you don't have to go about doing anything um, interesting or difficult. But if you wanted then to make different size pin cushions for different reasons, then uh, having a, uh, a way of working that out is a really good idea okay we need a tape measure and we need our tube so i'm going to do one for this tube to find the disc size for each end be the same obviously okay you need a bit of paper it doesn't have to be graph paper it can be any paper you need a bit of paper and a tape measure and your um, tube okay you're going to measure the circumference of the tube and an easy way to do that is to lay your tape measure onto one side which is four and a half and divide and then double it which gives you nine inches nine inches okay so then what we need we need three inches which is a third of that measurement which is pretty easy when i think about it three inches uh, cut into a little piece of paper okay so now it can it doesn't matter how wide it is you don't want it too wide but we're just cutting a little piece of paper that will be three inches long just to here like that off the end of there and then we're going to fold that in half, find the centre of that piece of paper, and then we'll put that down onto our paper here. And in my case, I've got really, really long doll needles. And this is actually one of the reasons I made started making very high pin cushions, 
because my doll needle, especially this one, will not fit in my uh, needle case. And I wanted somewhere safe to put it. And it, it sticks out just like so in the middle. It does not come out the other end. And I always know where it is. I think it's a bit of a dangerous tool, but I use it quite often. So I would not be without this one. Okay, so I'm going to then put this as a shorter doll needle uh, in the middle of this piece of paper. Like so. And you can see now this piece of paper, this little tiny piece of paper, will rotate around with the needle inside it. I will get a pen. And then as I rotate this piece of paper, I'll just draw. And you can see you get a perfect circle. And it is pretty perfect too, which is really, really good. Look at that. Very good. Now that now becomes the pattern for this one, for this actual um, tube. Now, if you were going to do them all the same size, uh, then this one would be your master pattern. This pattern here is for this one, for this piece here. And that's its little, little um, part. So that created that one. So it's good to, to do this little exercise and you will always have an individual size template or pattern for your felt discs. All right, now I'll cut that out and then I would cut that out of felt. Now, the beauty of felt is it doesn't, well, handmade felt does not fray. Um, and as I said, I, when I have these tops uh, for my pincushions, the felt is almost over felted and so we wouldn't put that in a garment it's very solid felt you might put it in a bag but it's a bit knobbly so it's as i said it's very good and interesting to put in to a pincushion okay so now that becomes the template for my felt my pattern for my felt to put you finish this particular um, pincushion so you can see this felt is a very interesting one Lots of colours in that, uh, lots of colours in this one, on the bottom as well, and this one here. Got this fixation with pretty felt. Okay, so I would cut that out, which I have, um, put that one aside, and go back to this one, which I have this one, which is half done, and the glove stitch is done now too. Okay. We pin mark in quarters. Okay, so pin mark in quarters is in half, and in half, first your felt disc and then the tube edge. So you can see the little pins, one, two, three, four. I now match those pins together like so. Take one pin out, put it through the felt and the side of the pin cushion and then you can actually take the felt pin out now this side of your pin cushion needs to have an opening so we won't be completely sewing it up in glove stitch because you need to be able to get into it to stuff it nice and firmly and that's the other reason why I do a lot of this work on foundation because stuffing these they have to they should be nice strong sides to these here and foundation will help it keep that strength without making them um, bulge out okay so i've now pin marked in quarters pin those that top together and now i can take the other pins out on the felt area okay right now, previously to, well, to recently, I suppose you could say, I did a lot of glove stitch in pearl thread, pearl 8, uh, sometimes pearl 12, and sometimes pearl 5. Now, pearl 12 is your fine one, pearl 8 is your general one, and pearl 5 is your thick one. Okay, so depending on what I did and how much I wanted to see this stitch, 
this is all about um, being obvious or receding into the background so you don't want to see it. And that will de determine the colour that you choose to sew this on. And I would suggest when you start doing glove stitch that you do a colour that blends in either with the felt or the fabric so you don't see any unevenness that you would maybe not be pleased with. As you get better at it, use a contrast thread so then you can see what the actual stitch looks like. Okay. Now, so what is glove stitch? As I said before, it's a very, very strong stitch. You can stuff it, things very firmly with it and it won't come apart, as you may see there. But it is a very easy stitch that is just an over and over stitch, but it moves in a specific way. So these days, I tend to use sashiko thread to, to um, sew my glove stitch with. But this one... This one here and this one here are both using pearl thread. You can see it's got the slight shine to it. That's how you always know. Okay, so it just depends on the look that you want. Okay, so I like to use half the amount. When you pull out your sashiko thread, I halve it because this, this thread does not need to be too long. It can get tangled because you're working quite fast when you do glove stitch and you don't want it to um, get all tangled by what you're doing. Okay, I'm using a, a sashiko needle because they're strong and they're sharp and they're quite rigid. And I, I, I use them for most things because they're such good needles. Okay, now we're gonna bury our knot inside the two layers. So you've got the felt there and you've got the side of the pin cushion there, and you're going to bury it in between, like so, like that. Now, this hand here, your left hand, or your not needle hand, would be the opposite if you're left-handed, is has got as much to do as your right hand, which is the action hand, okay? Because it is going to determine the depth of the stitch going into the fabric, this is very important because this is where the evenness comes in to the stitch. How deep it bites into the side of the fabric and the side or the top of the felt here. You can see the top of the felt, you don't really see it at all. But you, depending on the colour that you've chosen, you will very much see it on the side area here. Depending on the colour, though. Okay, simple as this is, uh, as, as I said before, it's easy to learn, takes a while to perfect. The needle will sit on my finger, okay? And that will determine how far I go into the fabric. So if I move my finger downwards, I'll go further into the fabric. If I bring it up, it's a narrower, it's a narrower stitch. Okay, so we're always pointing towards us. We're always pointing almost to our heart here with this stitch. It travels fast, but it always should be pointing totally at you. Okay, so I came out on the fabric, and now I'm going through from the felt into pointing towards me, and I pull it quite firm. Okay. I move across, I wrap the thread around this in, its index finger and then I do it again. Okay, now I've moved around about quarter of an inch. Okay, let it go and then stitch through that same hole and you're working blind here at the back here. Every now and then I'll tip it to make sure I'm as close as I can and I pull. And this is all this stitch is. You just continue doing these almost like a half or a triangle or a half diamond shape across. And that is glove stitch or French glove stitch. Can be done very, very tiny. If the thinner the thread, the scale 
of the um, stitch will be smaller and the thicker the thread the larger the stitch will appear okay i'm as you can see i'm biting down into the fabric and the felt quarter of an inch would be between i suppose it'd probably be between eighth and a quarter of an inch and this is to get it a good join together and i pull quite tight when i do this tight and then through again okay you can see it moves fairly quickly and i'm not really bothering about taking the pins out at this stage they're little tiny pins so they don't tend to get in my way glove stitch takes quite a lot of thread so i will i know i will run out but it's worth it because i don't get any tangles and i tend to then move quite fast around here around this edge okay now i always have my trusty pair of pliers here so if i'm going through some very thick fabric and the fact that i've been doing this is a long time now my fingers are not as nimble as they used to be and sometimes pulling pulling through quite thick fabric can be a bit of a challenge but for those people starting up sewing you may may have realized that you're actually using um, your hands in a completely different way and you almost have to build up a strength to them um, to get things looking very very tight or very very um secure okay so i took that pin out now that previous pin i'm way past it and i keep going as i said um before blanket stitch does not give you as a secure join of two fabrics as glove stitch does i'm almost on a crusade to get um glove stitch its rightful place in the stitching world because i think it's sort of been one of those stitches that's been forgotten a bit okay so i'm already this far around my disc so it's a real thick bit here of my felt that's all right I'll just pull it extra tight extra tight as you can see extra tight and you can see i move quite fast and i think that's one of the things people when they first do glove stitch they do their stitches way too close together and they almost look on top of each other and they're not happy with them because they do look a bit untidy and this is because they don't travel fast around the area that you're stitching okay now i forgot to tell you before we got started once you've glove stitched on you can safely take out your tacking stitch which held the seam allowance up of the loop of fabric like so a little pull and it should come out of course unless you've glove stitched on it and then that would be a real problem there we go there's that bit out and what happens then the because we've got rid of this tacking stitch we um are able to be able to see it look more the side a bit straighter okay i'll have to cut that little bit so i kind of did glove stitch that through that bit so i don't want to cut anything that i shouldn't be cutting okay so i almost, almost got that out i like to get it out before i start stuffing and now stuffing does not come with my kits because i physically couldn't fit it in um, 
But I'll give you some hints about stuffing. If you're not a person that has stuffing lying around, um, and you but you have an old cushion, and the cushion has got very flat, um, there's nothing to stop you, and I do it. I wash that cushion in the washing machine and dry it, and then I open up that cushion. Uh, this is the insert we're talking about, and I use the stuffing from the inserts, and they make really good stuffing. Uh, because as I said, just your inserts do get a bit um, flat and funny after a while. Okay, so you can see there I went inside the two layers again. I buried my knot between the two layers. And I'll leave this for now because I will then bury that inside in a moment when I get to two thirds of the, or three quarters, I should say, three quarters of the way around this uh, joining area. Okay, so off we go again. I sometimes straighten the edges of my glove stitch so it doesn't tend to bend over as I go. And I use my needle as a tool a lot. The needle is very useful as a tool to push things around. Okay, so we're nearly at three quarters. So I leave the needle and thread hanging get to three quarters and then i'll start stuffing don't pull out this lot of um, tacking until i've stuffed it because you will uh, the bit the area that is open will get very tatty and untidy if you um, release the um, fold over okay so where are we we're just about there this it just takes practice just like so many different things love stitch is practice so one two and as I say, sashiko thread is so strong, you can pull it quite hard and it doesn't uh, do any damage to the thread. Okay, so we'll take these two pins out like so and we have a tube. And I'll sew that back in in a minute. A tube like so with two ends in it. almost looks like a drum. I look like a little drum. And if I was going to do anything else more decorative to this, I sometimes put uh, this little felt ball. Uh, with a, a twisted a um, wax cotton cord through it and a little bead and that will get uh, put into this area now or even a flower in this case this one here if sometimes I make the flowers a bit small or I have one left over that I don't use and I put it inside a pin cushion here it's for no reason but being decorative but it is a good thing if you're ever somewhere else and they have similar pin cushions and you know exactly which one yours is because it will have this identifying flower or bead or or something hanging from it and you'll know exactly it's yours okay so it's well worth doing that so here's a whole lot of little felt balls in here that i've got that i would be using uh, for all sorts of things including um decoration okay so in my bag here i have some stuffing now this may not even be enough okay at this point in time so I gradually stuff this and it's going to be very firm. It's a very firm um, uh, stuffing job. And I put in little bits at a time and this is so I can pad out the corners, which is no corners on a tube, you would say, but pad it out and have no gaps. So, so we might even we'll probably get this finished today because I want to show you why I always have doll needles at hand. Very, very useful items, especially for um, originally for sewing uh, arms and legs to the bodies of dolls but for lots of other things too, including what I'm going to show you in a moment. 
Okay, so I've used up all that stuffing. And I probably could stuff some more in it. I probably will later. Um, but that will have to do for now. Okay. Now, because I want to make it easier to see when I join this up, I'm now going to join this up and it's completely then to the point of being a little drum or and it will be turning into little Otto very quickly. Okay, so I'm just, and you can see too, when you do glove stitch, you can't actually see where opening was. It is completely camouflaged by the stitch. You just have to count in towards your body and then in again and then move. So that's the action of your stitch. Okay, then bury that inside. Okay, like so. Just bury the thread like that coming up like so. And then I need to take out that tacking and then do the next step okay so i'll cut that off that in there take out my tacking there we go oh i mustn't get to bury that thread This bit, pull that out, just have a little play with it, puff it up a little bit. And that's probably where the knot of the tacking was. Just here to do. Okay. All right, we always have a little bit of sashiko thread hanging around, and that we will be using it again now. So we're going to measure across the middle. I just want to get that last little bit out of the top to find the middle, the centre, across here. So with our tape measure, we'll do that. And again, it's three inches, three inches. And we're going to find the middle and put a pin in it. And then a middle around about, yep, it's about right. And then you do it to the other end, the other end, so three. One and a half. Be a little bit that way. Okay, so we now have centre. So with your doll needle, you're going to turn this into a little version of an ottoman, which is um, a little cushion you sit on. Um, So I thread this with your Sachiko thread. And you can see this will go through mostly anything because it's so long. So with your doll needle, you're going to pierce the 
the top of the felt and then bring it out, feel around and bring it out to the bottom of the other side. Okay, leave a long little thing or a little extra bit of thread or put a knot in it so you don't pull it through, which I have. And then go back to the other side. Now, if you don't have a doll needle, they're easily found in most haberdashery areas. Or you can even use the longest needle you've got and squash this down really, really hard. And you should be able to get it through, okay, from one side to the other. So I'm, I'm probably spoiled a bit that I have got a doll needle that I'm able to do this with. Right, now I can take that pin out in my other pin cushion bring this up so there's still a loop there and if you have enough thread in your um, uh, needle you can actually go through twice so go through once and then go through twice it just depends on how long you you had in your needle so I'll try and do it twice to show you what it looks like when you do it twice okay okay like that try not to go through that loop and then take the needle out put it back in my very big pin cushion right so now you should have two loops on one side and a loop and ends on the other side so that pin can go out and you can do this with contrasting thread as well so it's just a bit of a fiddle at the moment to get the length so you can see them so you can do the next step and you're evening off the lengths i suppose you could say just evening them off so you've got something to play with when you're going to do the next step which is cutting them All right now the first one i cut or i tie i should say is the ends that have there we go there it is is these ends that are ends rather than a loop so I'll tie those in a knot so it doesn't come undone and you'll do one end first completely and this is so it doesn't all get pulled out and then pull this one the next thing you're going to do is under pressure okay so cut the this end like so and sometimes I try and wrap one around the other I hope you can see that like so and tie this one in a knot I oh, will trim these in a moment so they don't look so rough and ready. Like that in a knot. Okay, that should secure that side. Right, now turn it upside down. Grab hold of the other loop that's just disappeared a little bit. Squash it right down and then tie it. And you can see what happens is it pulls an indent into your pincushion. And this, so this, this end is very much under pressure. Um, I'm gonna pull my wool off. So you can get the effect of a, there we go. Um, of don't just cut it in the middle and you can get the effect of an ottoman which has got the pinched in appearance on the top okay so then the next one okay cut that wrap it around here And tie again and then we'll trim off those ends. 
bits. Okay, so that's bringing, pinching it in. And then I tend to tighten the other end. Ooh, yeah. Again, to bring it in. So we've ended up with three on this side, but that's all right. It still will work. Okay, so you can see that pulls it in. We now trim these back. No. Take out any little tacking stitches we might not have we might have missed before. And And then tie, give it a little roll in our hands. Thread up this little piece of sashiko thread. Get that buried inside and it's completely finished. So it is a very, I suppose it is an easy little project to do. But what is good about it it's only limited by your imagination so you can make all sorts of different types and there we go little otto so as i said this one's a stitch and flip one so you've got long longer pieces all sort of all different widths but all the same length as you can see to fit the side of um, your pincushion and you've got the wall with the pinched in center so that's all ready to go to be used as a pin cushion and as i mentioned before you will get stronger as you pierce the pin cushion more and more okay lots of different things we went through today like how to get a circle from a straight edge um, to make the ends of a tube how to do glove stitch Lots of practice, but easily done. It's an easy stitch, but um, takes a bit of practice to get it even, but is well worth um, having in your arsenal of stitches that you um, could use. Um, so this is number four of my tutorials. And number one, two, and three are up, ready to watch. So this will be joining very soon. So one, two, and three, uh, I had a glasses case. Uh, this style of bag which uh, had how to put in a zipper by hand and how to decorate it with a herringbone stitch you can see here so this is metal teeth zip so put in by hand and how to handle cross grain or bias cut fabric and also our very the very first class I did was how to make these how to make these little flowers but in the form of a scissor keep in this case, how to get this onto that to be able to use them as scissor keeps or decorations for your bags and, and even putting decoration into little Otto as well into here. Thank you for listening today. I hope to be back soon with another project um, or another technique that would be good to share with you all. Uh, have a happy day and keep sewing, keep stitching. Thank you.